Um, I uh, joined RISD in 2008. Uh, I joined RISD as president because of the Obama-McCain election. Uh, someone gave me this book called The Audacity of Hope. And um, I was a professor at MIT. And I was like, whoa, that's crazy. He wants to be president? That's crazy. Um, and uh, I, I was tenured. I didn't have to do anything at MIT. I could take <laughs> five pieces of paper and staple them, have my latte. and. It was a nice life, but I was like, wow, oh, wow, someone's trying to do something. So a headhunter called me up and asked if I want to be president of a college. And I said, oh, I haven't, been, I haven't been a dean. I was never a provost, anything like that. I can't be president, but this guy's trying to be president, so maybe I can do it too. Uh, so <laughs> I became president of a, a college, a prestigious college, mind you. Uh, been around for 130 years at the time. And uh, the moment I became president, uh, I also had that great experience of the financial crisis occurring at the same time, which is a terrible time to learn how to fly a 747 all of a sudden. Um, so I felt it like we all felt it, but I, as a, a person who came to leadership uh, later in life, who had to discover what this thing is that you all do uh, wherever you are, it was a kind of a shock. And I began to think a little bit differently than I thought before. Um, and when the economy went down, and the first thing I noticed everywhere, in all the press, it was all about how we're going to innovate our way out of this. We're going to innovate. We're going to innovate, and America's going to come back. And all the rhetoric was all about innovation. And innovation was going to come through STEM education, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And, and I went to MIT, so I'm no stranger to STEM education. Uh, but I always believed that STEM education was never enough for what I was doing in the world. Um, it had to be broad, more broadly thought. Um, STEM wasn't enough. Uh, what about STEAM? And that's something that we've been working at RISD for the past few years to really build a dialogue uh, in Congress. And uh, I was just in Congress two days ago. There's 55 US reps aboard the Congressional STEAM Caucus. It's a bipartisan caucus. And that's been exciting to watch that growth happen. And Babette, where are you? Babette has been, Babette has been the proud American, the artist who loves the US Constitution, who's made this all happen. So thank you, Babette. Now, I want to note that I, uh, I was someone who my parents um, believed in, in that way that immigrants believe in their child. And who, who's a family of immigrants here? Okay, bye -bye. So, so, you know, my parents, you know, they came from Japan and settled in Seattle, had a tofu shop. My, my father was a cook. My mother was a secretary. They worked together, working together as a couple, bad for a family. <laughs> um, but anyways, we were always working and working as family business. And, uh, and um, and my dad went to uh, the uh, parent-teacher conference in second grade. And my teacher said to him, John is good at math and art. And the next day, my dad said to one of the customers that John is good at math. <laughs> and I was waiting for him to add the art part. But he didn't say it. And I've always been wondering, why didn't he say you know, art? You know? and, uh, and why is it in general, when someone says to their mom and dad, I want to be an artist, there's a kind of frightening moment. <laughs> you know, if, Dad, I want to be a doctor. Awesome. I want to be a lawyer. Great. I want to be an artist. Ah, you know, like, so, and why is that? It's because we associate art with poverty. Um, we think of these starving artists. No one wants their kid to starve. Um, and so a lot of my work has been to shift the dialogue away from this notion that to be an artist is to be a starving one, because it is uh, largely false. Um, now, in my own work, I went to MIT. Um, I studied computer science and device physics. I went to art school after that and began to make things on the computer. And in the early 90s, I made images like this that most people could not make at the time because computers were still emerging. So I had many clients in Japan that would ask me to make things that were very hard to make, uh, which because I understood computers, um, it was not difficult. I had many clients, uh, Absolute, uh, Chanel, um, Google, uh, a variety of clients uh, I worked with. Uh, I felt very lucky because I had a chance to combine my math 
and my art together in an era when computers were just emerging. Um, and I also was very lucky to have good teachers. I see the GW professors, even though we guys not GW professors. You know, I was very influenced by my professors. And one of my professors uh, said to me in the 90s, because I would make all these things for the computer, and it was a rarity to combine these skills. And he said to me, you know, John, you'll never know if you're any good or not if you can't educate more people who can do what you do, so they will one day hunt you down to kill you. It's very Japanese. Uh, but uh, anyway, so I did that at MIT. I, 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 my, my goal in the 90s was to bring together people who were top designers, top technologists, and help them go across that boundary of creativity and technology. And um, uh, in, in the early 2000s, MoMA began to accession my work. And so I began to realize I could stop. So I stopped doing that. My students are doing really good work now today in the world. And I've, I had to change my life. And by changing my life, I mean I was looking for perspective. It's a nice thing about getting older. You discover there's this thing called perspective. You're so busy in it that you can't see it. And you're like, oh, OK, there's something called perspective. Um, and I began looking for it and borrowing everything that I could find. Uh, this is work by Scott Heiferman. He's the CEO of meetup.com. And Scott talks about how in the old days, you had this thing, this technology called the coffee table. And the coffee table was something you would sit around and drink coffee and just talk. It's a crazy idea. Uh, and that was before TV, because after TV, um, you would all orient towards this box and you would watch TV together, and you would maybe drink coffee or not, didn't matter. You also wouldn't talk to each other anymore, but you'd watch TV. Um, and then after the TV, uh, we got to the computer, and the computer was this idea of sort of being sitting by yourself. Uh, and those of you who have like families, know families look like this now. Everyone's got their <laughs> own computer or iPad or whatever, you know. Um, and uh, now in the age of mobile phones, and mobile phones are essentially television sets that you carry around and shine in your face. And so this is the world today. We're like, whoa, TV on my face. Um, and if you think about the world of Google Glasses, that's shining in a TV on your eyeball. So that's how the world has evolved. And you ask yourself, has it evolved a lot? Well, it's changed a lot, how it feels a lot. But I like to say that. Technology may have changed everything, but the only thing that keeps changing is technology. It hasn't changed human nature. Um, that hasn't changed at all. Um, design is a very popular topic today, uh, and I think a large, in large part because technology no longer has the impact it used to have. Those of you, those of you in the industry know about Moore's Law, the idea that transistors will double every 18 months and stay the same price, if not lower. Um, that Moore's Law was a powerful guide in the 70s and 80s and the 90s. It meant you could get a faster computer. Everybody needed a faster computer to remain competitive. But now in 2013, you can choose of the new iPad Air a 32 gigabyte iPad Air or a 128 gigabyte iPad Air. You probably will not buy the 128 because you'll never use all those gigabytes. You know that. They can't fool you anymore. They can fool you differently with a weight thing. <laughs> but no, I don't really need that much more technology. So, so technology already works. And because technology works, design now becomes more important. How it feels, how it tastes, matters, how, how, matters more than how fast the meal is. So, and design, is, however, design, you know, I'm from the Rhode Island School of Design. Design is a funny word and has so many meanings. And that's why when people say, I don't understand design, I like to say it's because it has so many uses. It's like duct tape. <laughs> it can be many things in many contexts. And uh, for instance, so I have like 25 definitions of design. I've begun a blog called whatisdesign.net. Uh, but design, this is one example of design. So design, you find this beautiful word sign in it. And um, this is a sign from St. Petersburg, Russia. You guys are global travelers. Who's been to St. Petersburg, Russia? My gosh, look at this room. It's amazing. Like one person usually. There were like eight people just now. Nine. Uh, ten. OK, stop. Okay. Uh, I'm impressed. I'm impressed. You guys are all over the world. Um, but 
So this is at St. Petersburg, and this is that tourist thing where there's a gold, the Golden Palace, whatever. And so I'm arri I've arrived, and I noticed this sign. And I felt kind of offended because, like, I'm American. I'm a tourist. You're telling me don't walk in the grass. I hear you. Russians telling me this. Like, whoa, that feels kind of hard. Like, why not tell it to the Russian people? And I found this sign for the Russian people, which was much more intense. <laughs> Um, it says, no swimming, no hiking, no driving, no trash, no dogs, no fire or alcohol. And this great one says, no plants. <laughs> you go on a date with a friend, you bring your plants along, <laughs> it's like, you know? Or even worse, no love. <laughs> so, um, it's one sign. Um, I also collect emergency signs, uh, fire exit signs in every city of the world. And each city has its own signature through the emergency exit sign. So this is a sign from Chicago. And so if there's a fire, you should run from it. Um, and this is a sign in Miami. <laughs> you know? They got their martini. <laughs> you don't want to run too fast. It's going to be OK. So I'll take care of it. Uh, that's Miami, and uh, this one is uh, Paris, you know. <laughs> you know how to book in Paris. Uh, so anyways, signs tell a lot about culture. This is in Seattle, in Nike town. You get it? They're skinny. Uh, but anyways, these kind of signs are everywhere, and they tell us things. This is in Denmark at Lego headquarters. This was the most self-aware sign, because it's like, look, are you looking at me? <laughs> so I was like, whoa. So I. I kind of stopped doing this after this guy started doing that. Um, but what is design besides signs? It's about making signs. Because if you can make a good sign, you can make a difference. I hear that Edward Tufte came here to speak. Um, example of making signs that say something. Um, and so um, because when you make a sign, you make a meaning, which is kind of dangerous sometimes. Because sometimes you can distort a meaning. So that's why we are so cautious when we see something visual, because we know we might be being full. Think of magicians. They're always fooling us. So we can be easily fooled by what we see. Um, and when people say that I don't really understand design, or they can't draw in particular, I tell them that they can all draw. If anyone can put a dot on paper, they can draw, because guess what? You drew a dot. And if you move that dot in space, the dot becomes a line. It's evolved. So you're drawing a line. You just see who said you can't draw. You just drew a line. And you can draw a line. You can draw shapes. You can draw a triangle. You can draw circles and squares. You can also give the line some taste. You can give it texture. You can make it thick and thin and messy and chewy. You can give it color to give it flavor, to give it emotion, to give it impact. Red feels some warmth, you know, blue, it feels cold. And so drawing is, everyone can draw. The question is, can you draw something that means something? Um, and this is my favorite example of why drawing is important in the data space. This is three columns of numbers. And so if you look at the first column of numbers, it becomes a, a random scatter plot. But in this column, in the yellow, you can see there's a line hidden in the data. And in this column here, you find a circle. So I was like, whoa, so there's data inside there. I couldn't see it before. And now that you made it visual, I can see it. That's the power of making meaning out of visuals. Um, and if you think of the great, uh, we hear this word used a lot, data scientists now. Uh, because of Nate Silver's thing and data scientist. Um, you know, the first data scientist, I believe, is Florence Nightingale. And I remember when I was a kid, the Golden Key, series from the Golden Key when you're a kid, Florence Nightingale, the British nurse taking care of people bleeding and, you know, the nurse kind of thing. Uh, she was a statistician by training. And she made this influential diagram that showed uh, the following. Uh, and this is going in a, in a year's cycle around the circle. Um, the, the red is soldiers dying in the field. And the blue is a soldiers dying in the hospital. So with one simple visual, she was able to change national policy around the sanitary conditions in hospitals. 
Again, using a powerful image to communicate something of life or death importance to a country uh, is transformative. Um, and I like to always say that when we talk about fonts and type of the computer, when you choose a font, you choose a design, you choose a tone, you're making a choice, you're a designer, in effect. In design, there are two aspects of what you're working with. On the one hand, you have what is called form, which is how it looks. On the other hand, you have content, is what it means. And when you fuse the two together in a really excellent way, you create great design. So for instance, in this case, the word fear is a word that is the content, fear, terrifying words. We don't like the, that content. In terms of the form, we're using light Helvetica to show it, so it isn't very scary. Um, but if we make it big, it's kind of scary all of a sudden. So you were small before, now you're big. You're, you're fearful. Just that distance changed how you felt. Or if you make it like pirate typeface, like Captain Jack Sparrow, like, ah, fear. It's like, fear. You're a joke, fear. I'm not afraid of you, fear. Or if you're like fear, like the nightclub fear, <laughs> like it's amazing there. <laughs> the DJ is crazy. Let's go to fear. Come on, you know? So changes things. Or if you have fear where you have the letters all huddling together, like on the deck of the, of the Titanic. It's like, oh no, I'm feeling afraid. And so the form shifts, creates an emotion in you. So the content, the same, fear, 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 but we feel it differently. Or fear like this, which I call the high class restaurant typeface. <laughs> it's like fear, I cannot get a reservation into fear. The hors d'oeuvres are $5 each, but I will die for each, it's fear. It's like, you know, like, oh, it's like upscale. Um, and that's the content, fear. And if you just change the content, if you just change one letter of fear, and it becomes the content free, the whole world changes. Because free is a much better kind of content. Because everyone likes free. I mean, free is like, oh my god, you see free, you run towards free. Uh, free bold feels like freedom, feels powerful, it's resonant. You feel fear, uh, if you feel free in light, it feels philosophical, it feels good. If you set free uh, even further outward, give it some space, it feels like you can breathe in the, the free. And if you add a, a blue gradient, it changes things as well. Different slide. Design thinking. So, <laughs> my own thinking. Uh, so design thinking is the thing that we all talk about now in the policy space of how to use design. Um, and Design thinking, when I first came upon the phrase, I wasn't sure what it meant. Because I design, and I think, and why am I calling something design thinking? Because that's kind of obvious and natural. And I would see it branded everywhere by design thinking. By design thinking. Which oftentimes looks like post-it notes. Let's do design thinking. Let's use post-it notes. Is post-it notes design thinking? It was very confusing to me, actually. So I began to unpack it a little bit. So design thinking, I have found four definitions um, online. Uh, uh, one is define, research, ideation, prototype, choose, implement, learn. Another one is by IDEO, inspiration, ideation, implementation. Another is by Rotman School of Business, Roger Martin, the famous design strategy consultant. Uh, mystery, heuristic, algorithm, uh, frog design, another competitor to IDEO. Uh, imagine, make, plan, seek around a goal. If you notice, there isn't a single definition of design thinking. I have found 30 more definitions of design thinking. So I, as a consumer of design thinking, as a practitioner, am slightly confused. So if you were confused about it, don't worry. I am too. Uh, that said though, what is not confusing is this notion that what is common across all of them is this funky part. It's this part that's about ideation, mystery, imagination. And that's something that's kind of cool. You know, you would never, um, you would never see a McKinsey briefing where he says, the mystery part. Let's talk about the mystery part. I'm like, <laughs> like, what? Yeah, that's the good part. So that part we don't talk about because 
We are trained as people who execute to do things well. Oh, it reminds me of how I have a, one of our alumni, uh, Mrs. Chung in uh, Korea, I went to see her. And uh, uh, her family has all the, uh, the, uh, the Shinsegae department stores. And I was visiting her, her, her house and she was saying, we're talking about stuff. And I was saying, oh yeah, so-and-so works really hard. Works really hard. And then she got really angry all of a sudden. <laughs> she was like, works hard? She says, I hate people who work hard. I said, whoa, that's strong. <laughs> working hard, no, I don't like working hard. And I said, well, why? And she said that people who work hard have small dreams. I said, whoa. So <laughs> I said, well, what do you like? And she said, I like people with big dreams who execute well. So I like that framing a lot. And if you think about it, a mystery is a kind of a big dream. The question is, can you execute against it? Um, and so my question about design thinking, which isn't an answer per se, is design thinking is very close to the way artists think in its best composed manner, which is artists are very comfortable with the mystery. They're very comfortable with the enigma. They will stop you from trying to solve the puzzle. I've got the solution, no, stop. No, I, I want to solve it, no. So artists are able to stop like at 99% at of the way and be totally okay, you know? So that's something powerful because as you all know, we live in a completely different speed of the world that has too many inputs. And so in some senses, what I learned from artists today is that kind of frame, a frame of extreme comfort with the enigma. Uh, extreme comfort with not knowing. Extreme comfort with not even being able to accept something that someone says to you because I'm, you won't even let it into you because you're letting it sit and rest in that uncomfortable place you might normally have. Now, uh, I recently wrote a piece last week on higher education because we're kind of talking about higher education today as well. Um, uh, or a piece just came out last week. It was called Disrupting the Diploma. And um, it's get gathering some kind of debate online, so I find it interesting. Um, uh, but uh, I wrote about the following. Um, uh, it's a very simple premise. You know the Coinstar machine? The Coinstar machine? The Coinstar, you take your change and you pour it in. And um, I firmly believe, as others believe too in the world, that in the future, colleges will be heavily weakened. We will still be around, of course, but we will be weakened. Coursera opening, Lila, where are you, Lila? Uh, you, know, you know, that kind of stuff's happening. Um, uh, in the future, we'll just take all our credentials and pour them into a degree star machine. And out will pop out, you know, oh, you're 90% of the way to a Stanford MBA equivalent. Or you're, I mean, that's, that's already kind of happening. It hasn't happened yet. Who will be the aggregator of that? Will it be Coursera? Will it be LinkedIn? Will it be Apple? Who knows? Will it be Harvard.com? We don't know yet, but that's coming because, and the reason why it's coming is because the problem with college that we don't talk about much is that college was designed as a construct when we died in our 40s and 50s, right? We would gorge on information, like in our early life, and then we would like go and live and die. And that life wasn't like more than 20 years. I mean, you could like last on that you went to the fridge when you were a kid. You just gorge, like, oh, I'm going to learn everything I ever need to know. And then you live and you die. Now we live to the 80s and 100s. So our trip to the fridge is not going to take us there. So the model is going to be transformed just because of longevity. So that's a fascinating thing for me, at least. Um, and um, I have many humbling moments on campus where I realize, wow, I am unnecessary as a president of a college. Uh, and I like that, actually, too. Um, so like, uh, for instance, there's this professor at, at RISD. His name is Michael Fink. Oh my gosh, he's like the best professor ever. Uh, he's an English professor. Uh, I've, I've visited at least a thousand alumni now in the field and uh, uh, individually, and they will all say to me their favorite class at Rhode Island School of Design was English. I'm like, English? That's a drawing or like modeling or whatever. English. And it, and, it, and it dawned upon me 
after a pattern of people, like it was this person named Mike Fink, who is uh, our longest teaching professor. He's this adorable, complex, interesting, wonderful, lyrical man. And uh, Mike Fink is, I follow Mike Fink. He's uh, really the, the guy I go to for every kind of like little bit of advice on life, et cetera. And um, you know, I, it was the year when the square came out. And the square came out roughly three years ago, the mobile payments device. And uh, I asked Jack Dorsey, if RISD could be the first site to give them away at commencement. So we were the first place to give them away to all graduating seniors because our students make things and want to sell them. And instead of taking cash or a check, the square enabled them to take a credit card swipe. Um, but anyways, when I got all these squares in my office, I realized, oh my gosh, I can imagine a world that could happen right now where, where Mike Fink could be in that park and he can be taking credit card swipes from students who want to learn from him. And the building I'm in could become a park. You know, the president's building, whatever. Um, and I realized how the administration list model can all occur. The question is, when will it occur? Um, but uh, these things have always uh, bothered me, but also excited me. And that's because I came from MIT, where this was all coming, and now I can see it actually here. So it's kind of amazing. Um, and you guys, are, you, guys are, you guys are voraciously trying to acquire as much of this kind of information. Um, and I can see, and you can see, it's just changing so many things. Um, and that's why a lot of our work uh, nationally is about the importance of not just technology, but the role of arts education. Because technology is only as good as what it's supposed to be doing for you, for people. And technology does not address those questions because technology is about faster, cheaper, lighter, bigger. Um, so the arts, uh, um, the, the arts thought broadly are critical because the arts are about the human experience, the reason why we're alive. And so when we began to see all this STEM stuff, uh, we saw an opportunity to ask the question, well, what is STEAM? Uh, because many people want to know what STEAM is, and that's the work that Babette is leading right now as we speak. Um, it comes from one simple idea, uh, the fact that the U.S. has always been able to do things with art uh, and manufacturing. Um, Rhode Island School of Design was founded uh, by a textile family, and the textile family in Rhode Island was losing competitiveness to European textiles. European textiles were designed better. American textiles weren't. They didn't have the right kind of patterns, the most popular patterns, the most interesting use of technology. And so RISD was developed to enable Rhode Island to compete internationally, um, to use design to differentiate the technologies that were being used at the time, which were mills. And if you think about it historically, this advent of using design to empower technology has always been there. If you think of cars, Automobiles, when they were invented, they were so exotic. No one could make a car. But once everyone could make a car in the world, how to make a better car was no longer as important as, is it a car that I want? Does it fit me? Is it part of my lifestyle? So in America, we advanced the idea of designing cars to make them desirable, not just as technology objects, but technology experiences. And if you think about Fast forward to today, uh, just, just, just 10 years ago, no one had a music player. We had Walkman and things like that. And there were these things called Rio MP3 players that nobody wanted. But Apple integrated design into music players and built an entire ecosystem to support music sharing. And that design enabled this market to emerge. Another story, uh, the hotel market. Um, uh, hotels, motels, we're so used to, this group must have like so many frequent flyer points. <laughs> but uh, um, you go to you know, hotels, motels, we're used to going to these places. Um, but there were two RISD graduates named Joe Gabia and Brian Chesky, uh, who founded a company called Airbnb, which is disrupting the hotel industry, such that now on any given day, there are more people staying in Airbnb uh, uh, units than they are in the entire Hilton system globally. And Joe and Brian are perfect examples of the new, um, kind of, uh, the new kind of tech startup. 
In the old day, you'd be two technologists, and you'd hire half a business person, half a designer. Now you're two designers, and you'll hire half a technologist, half a business person. So that's, that, that shift is occurring. Um, and also in the sciences, scientists are looking for ways to go deeper and to go broader in their work. And I loved in the Time 100 list one year, Dr. David Ho, uh, he was working with a molecule model that doesn't use the ball and stick, it's using clay and dye. And so you can see scientists are trying to go off road to find representations. I'm sure in your fields right now, you're trying to go off road to find the untraveled path to get the tool to help our country. This is so exciting. Uh, <laughs> um, and um, at RISD, we have this uh, um, uh, site called the Edna Lawrence Nature Lab, uh, which holds 80,000 specimens of uh, animals, rocks, uh, minerals, uh, no vegetables. But um, uh, this site was the site of a National Science Foundation sponsored uh, event to launch STEAM uh, in this country. And this movement's been adopted by so many uh, players, uh, and everyone from the Blue Man group, you know Blue Man, the Blue Man, the Balls Blue Man. Um, the Blue Man schools, the, the Blue Schools involved, the NEA's involved, Sesame Street. Uh, Elmo just launched their, uh, his uh, STEAM season last year. Um, so a lot of people are coming into STEAM, it's exciting. And, and we're, we're part of that uh, kind of a cheer squad to move things forward. We also began something called the Meharam STEAM Fellows, and this is something that if one of your offices is looking for uh, any talented uh, young, uh, young people from RISD, uh, it's an opportunity. Because uh, I, as I began to do my work in Washington, I discovered that there were so many unpaid internships everywhere. Uh, and that benefits people who live here locally. But um, the, we, we secured from uh, an old friend, Michael Meharam, uh, a granting program so that uh, 10 RISD students can work in unpaid internships anywhere they want to and they'll get paid a stipend. And uh, they've worked in the DOD, um, they worked in the, the Capital of Providence, one worked at the World Economic Forum this summer. So if you're looking for these kinds of interns, we, we have a group that's growing. Let's see, this is Airbnb. Uh, um, so, a lot of my work right now is in, on both coasts, in Washington and also in Silicon Valley. Because of the Airbnb guys, uh, what's happened is in Silicon Valley, they're looking for new ways to make startups, and so designers are very popular. They're also in short supply now. Um, and Jack Dorsey came to campus uh, last year uh, to say, and, and he said this thing, you know, RISD is a school I wish I went to. I held on to that one. Uh, <laughs> And uh, also, we have Representative Cicilline hosting Democratic Leader uh, Pelosi for a special advanced manufacturing session to pull steam into this uh, dialogue about advanced manufacturing as well. And uh, it's just been kind of exciting to watch because um, a lot of my work now, uh, when I went back to that point of uh, I was making things, I got my work to MoMA, got kind of lost, looking for perspective, became a college president, um, discovered this field that you're all in, which is leadership. And uh, I was just saying how um, uh, I discovered the work of John Gardner. And I was like, whoa, this guy, John Gardner. You guys probably all have John Gardner, all of like tattoos maybe, but, uh, <laughs> but I just loved his work because it, so, uh, it, so, it was so at the moment that has never changed in America. And so my work now has been involved in leadership specifically, uh, creative leadership, what can leaders learn from artists and designers, how they think. And uh, I, uh, um, my presentation at the last year's World Economic Forum uh, was about leadership. And um, I've been showing images like this. I've been drawing images to explain leadership to more people, to find new frames of leadership. And uh, this is from my mountain series. Um, because uh, after I uh, got tenure at MIT, um, someone told me, um, you're creative. So don't worry about the money. And I used to hate being told that. So I got my MBA as a kind of hobby. And uh, I remember like uh, business school was always about like, you know, you're gonna CEO, you're gonna work your way up the top, you're gonna like, take your team up the mountain, you know? And um, uh, I was always struck by how th that rhetoric was so inaccurate to what leaders really do. Um, you know, you, 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 the whole idea is to go up the mountain but no one tells you that the goal is to jump off the mountain. Um, because you have to do something. 
And when you jump off the mountain, everyone's wondering, will you survive or not? <laughs> right? So it's like, well, this isn't like, is it going to hit the water? It's going to hit the land? I don't know. And then once you hit the water, if you're lucky enough to hit the water, it's extremely disorienting because there might be a shark in there too. <laughs> and you come out and you're reborn, the crucible of leadership, the quote unquote crucible. And when you're reborn, you stabilize and then you go back up the mountain again. And so I think leaders have the capacity to be constantly reborn, or as John Gardner said, to be constantly renewed. And that kind of psychology is something that I find very interesting. Because this cycle that you see as leaders is not unlike what artists do all the time. Um, artists are very used to cycling uh, in this mode of constantly failing. Um, uh, Rocco Landisman, the former uh, chairman of the NEA, would say not failing but productively failing. And so artists are very good at this. And so I've been talking a lot about how this kind of model of, of, of failing um, is important. But the problem or the opportunity or the problem, depends how you, how you, how you cast that, is that most artists um, are always against the man. You know, when you're a creative person, you're always against the man. And I saw this great Sprint PCS commercial in 2006. Is that your it's new Sprint phone? Uh-huh. With Sprint's new fair and flexible plans, no one can tell me what to do. I can talk when and how I want. It's my little way of sticking it to the man. But you are the man. I know. <laughs> so you're sticking it to yourself. Maybe. Sprint's new fair and flexible plans. So, I remember this commercial vividly, and it was hard to find it, but um, uh, creative people are always against the man. And as a creative person, I was always against the man. But becoming, becoming president, I was suddenly the man. <laughs> and for a creative person to adopt that frame is not easy. And so I've been very public about it. I've written a lot about this question of how do creatives learn how to lead and to take what they know into this space. Um, and when I was at MIT, I was always curious about how people work together. Because being at MIT was great because there are some extreme personalities there. And so I got to see all kinds of things. Um, and so I began to try to carve away at my, my future professional goals. And I've kept this since 2003, uh, when I was a young professor. I was, uh, my four professional goals in life, uh, and they went like this. Number one, don't speak ill of others. I thought this was really important. Um, number two, avoid passive aggressive behavior. It's so easy to get passive aggressive, it's so tasty. Um, <laughs> listen broadly and don't waffle on decisions. Everyone gets to waffle, so listen broadly, listen, but you gotta listen, but you gotta go. And lastly, when an error, admit, apologize, and move forward. So I've always held on to these kind of rules of how I operate. Every year um, <coughs> at New Year's, I look at it to see how, how I'm failing at uh, trying to stay close to these four rules. And going back to the audacity of hope, um, I was asked on a stage um, in New York by the curator of MoMA uh, at MoMA, Paolo Antonelli, what is the difference between audacity and courage? And it was the best question I was ever asked in a long time. I was like, and, and I gave this lame answer. And then I came off stage, and the next day I kept thinking about this question. Because, and I found this um, great book by uh, Samurai, uh, Samurai Fight, Samurai Warrior Fighting, an ancient book from the 1800s, uh, 1600s. And uh, it was saying how like um, the code of the samurai, the warrior essentially, is all about um, courage. And courage is clearly defined. Courage, the warrior, is knowing what you're going into completely and accepting it. And so it's when I realized audacity is having no idea what you're going into and just going into it. And I would choose a courage over audacity on any day. So every time I think about this question, I think, am I being audacious or courageous? Make sure you choose the courageous, because that's a little smarter. Um, and um, I uh, did an art project in 2011. Um, uh, many people ask me if I still make art. Um, I say I have a big art installation. It's called Round School of Design. It doesn't work all the time. So uh, I had a show in London in 2011. Um, I have two crazy friends uh, who own a gallery uh, in an old building from the 1700s. 
And um, they said, hey, you want to have a show? You know, show five years ago, I have a show. I'm president of a college. I can't do that. I have no time. No problem. Just show up, and we'll pour sand on the floor, and you just hang out. <laughs> I said, OK, that sounds good. So uh, <laughs> it was like Saturday. I made a few objects, uh, and then I got on the plane. Uh, and they took all my tweets. I use Twitter a lot. Um, Twitter, I'm not a social media expert. Uh, I don't use Twitter for social media-ing. It's more like of my public therapy. Um, I don't talk to everybody online, like, hey, whatever, I can't, I can't do that. But uh, it's my public therapy. Of what if something I've learned, I'll just put there. So it's like my public notepad. And uh, they took all the uh, Twitter posts. But um, they refer to this one thesis. And the thesis is that um, we had this idea of the hierarchy, which was such a great idea because um, you, if you want to talk to the person at the top, you would talk through people. But as you know, because of social media, because of things like email, uh, but, if, but because those walls we used to have are easy to just sort of step over. Um, and so we moved from an organizational hierarchy to what I like to call a, an organizational hierarchy, where everyone believes they have a say in everything now because they can access you. And why didn't you get back to me uh, a second ago? Uh, and so the question is of this day of leadership is not how do you make the hierarchy work better, how do you make the hierarchy work better? And the hierarchy is a much more complex construct. It isn't a social media construct, it's an old tribal construct. And how can technology help you do that is a question I've been trying to scratch away at to bring design and, techno and technology to leadership. And um, that's why I've been doing experiments for the last uh, five years. I was much more active in the early years um, because artists are people who like to get their hands dirty. So I've got my hands dirty in all kinds of ways. And um, I'm going to give you some examples. So uh, because I was talking to parents one time. And parents uh, of, of, at a college, they know everything because they're like, so smart. And um, one told me this thing. He said, always use for example to achieve clarity. It is so good. If you're stuck, just say, for example, and it's, it'll all be OK. So for example, uh, one of the first things I did on campus is when I was announced as president, everyone would write to me and say, John, so great. You're becoming president. Let's have coffee. Like, I can't drink that much coffee. And, and why do you want to meet with me? You know, Why can't we meet in the open? This is America. Let's meet in the open. So I had a blog where anyone could, would, this is like six years ago, mind you, where anyone can talk to me on the blog. But that's laughing. But um, anyway, and so like, I would like just like, I'd see something, I'd write about it, I'd talk to everybody on campus all at the same time. And my HBS buddy said, John, make it even better. Why don't you have anonymous Thursdays where anyone could be anonymous just on Thursdays? I said, sure, I'll try it. Um, and so on Thursdays, which was the most popular day to visit the blog, uh, I would be talking to anonymous people. And um, I can type very fast. Um, anyways, it would, uh, and, I, and because I was so audacious, I had no idea what I was doing. Um, and, and, uh, and, but through the process, I, I was able to learn a lot about the institution at a very high rate, but at a certain cost, at a cost to the strictly defined hierarchy that wanted to reassert itself. And I learned that, and it, but it was an interesting lesson. Um, I also learned that because I came from the media lab and I'm from the world of technology, I believed so much in technology. But by being in a small college campus, I learned quickly that this idea of let's solve it with a website is not a good solution. The best solution is free food. Um, I like this technology. Uh, and I'll tell you why. Uh, it's because, and I couldn't figure out why uh, until like last year. I was talking to a professor of architecture who's very involved in China. Uh, he's uh, originally French, but he's, uh, he's, always, he's always in China. And he said to me that, because um, uh, uh, I was making lunch for him, and I always make food to sort of make things, like to make things. And he said, oh, it's great you're making, making food. That's very important. That's very Chinese. I said, I'm not Chinese. I'm Japanese, but that's OK. But I'm doing that kind of thing, whatever. <laughs> and then, and then um, he said, um, um, 
He said, that's really good. I said, so why? And he says, well, you know, um, in America, when we negotiate a contract, we'll negotiate, we'll negotiate, we'll negotiate. And then what we'll do is we'll have the steak dinner to celebrate. Steak dinner, wine, beer, at the very end. He said, in China, what we'll do is we'll eat first. And by eating first, and by eating the same foods together, we become the same person. And when we become the same person, then we can negotiate differently. And I, I like this, I like the poetry of this, because in essence, it is a true scientific fact that if you're eating the same foods together, you're consuming the same DNA. It's a powerful, very subtle idea that I bring to all my thinking is, do we have food? <laughs> is the food gonna connect us together? Uh, I'm a big believer in it. And again, from the technology world, uh, I have learned so much about what it can do and also what it absolutely can't do. Um, and so I'm a reformed technologist in a way. Um, I also had an experiment where I would make, um, uh, uh, you know, there's always like a campus letter from the president or community letter, you know. So I began to make them handwritten. And so I make handwritten letters to campus and some people like them, some people hate them, but you know, I would just sort of like test different ways to connect with people uh, because that is the, the goal of leaders is to connect somehow, just to give a try, just fail constantly, but try this and try that. Um, and uh, I finally converged on this format, uh, which is uh, open office hours with the president. And so, Hours get opened up on campus, and then people can press the schedule your appointment now button. I reappropriated a hair salon reservation system. <laughs> so you can like choose a 10 minute cut or whatever kind of thing, and uh, people just show up. And uh, it's, very easy to, it's very easy to administer, because you just say like, here it is, and they did the self-service, and they come, and that's been great to be another way to, to do micro interactions. But again, with everything you try, there'll be those who will say you have failed. And I love that part. It's like a movie in a way. Um, because you would understand how like, uh, uh, my office hour construct is 10 minute appointments. And so people come for 10 minutes and someone says, this is not enough time. How dare you not give me an hour? And I'm like, okay, I'm really sorry. But for those who have 10 minutes, like I'm so glad I have 10 minutes. And so how do you balance it? It's such a great life question. Um, let's see. Uh, I wrote this once. The shortest communication path between two people is a straight talk. It is such a powerful thing to have that straight talk. It is just so hard. And I respect the work that you guys are doing. You guys are like traveling the world, having straight talks with all kinds of people. Um, I have to say, I should probably end now. I want to thank all of you for the stuff you're doing. I'm very passionate American because I'm such a believer that this country can do so many things. And when I come into, uh, to when I meet people who are doing all this work on behalf of the country, I want to say thank you. I think it's the kind of work that I know matters. If I didn't become a college president, I would no idea what you guys do. Uh, but I have a sense of it and I respect it. And, uh, I hope I can ask, uh, try to answer a few questions to be useful to you today. Thank you. When you say that artists are comfortable in the mystery and the unknown, and you also say that it's better to be courageous and know exactly what you're getting into, how do you explore and reconcile those two concepts? Oh, can I have that? Can I have the technology? Let's see. How do I? I, I, I can't have a computer here. Oh no, I'm powerless. Uh, <laughs> I have a slide that explains that. Okay. Um, there's two frames. Uh, I call them the authoritative frame of leadership and the creative frame. If you Google authoritative, creative, my last name, a slide will appear that tries to sort of uh, divide them. That's one piece of information. The second piece of information steps back a little broader, um, not specifically about artists, but organizations and institutions. Um, I wrote a piece called Startups versus Endups because everyone loves startups. Like, oh, the startup is so agile, you know, kind of thing. But a startup, when it grows up, 
becomes an end up, right? Like America was a startup. Now it's an end up, you know? And that's not a bad thing, mind you. You know, end up bad versus end up good. And because of the market conditions, the end up feels it has to act more like a startup because there's so many vibrations, so you have to match the vibration. That said, though, I want to say that end ups are really good at what they do. They can do scale like startups can't. Startups are good at agility but can't do scale, and that's their disadvantage. And artists are people who are great at startup, excellent startup, but have difficulty as end up people. So that's something I've noticed in my studies. Just startup, end up, and authoritative creative comes up on. That's, that's much faster. I can't shuffle through. I can't do that. So thank you. Next question. Hi. We had the opportunity to speak earlier. I have just connected you with Deborah Obalil. Oh, All set. There you go. Awesome. Check. I'm a Pratt <laughs> alumnus. You started off with the economy. You morphed into colleges without campuses. And in our talk earlier, I'm Carrie Deva from the Center of Copyright Integrity. And we talked briefly about the value of copyrights and protecting copyrights and as it's in, in, integral to the economy moving forward. In all fairness, we have a State Department that is our ambassador for the arts. Um, it's not just about jobs, the economy, it's about intellectual property. And to the benefit of our worlds and what we're doing in Congress, it would be lovely to share the value of our copyrights and how artists survive on their intellectual property. And it's artists, writers, dancers, everything is defined under Title 17. I will comment on that. Um, first of all, you know, I've been a big fan of uh, Lawrence Lessig's work. You know, Lawrence Lessig's work. Uh, <laughs> Lessig lovers here. Uh, I'm a Lessig lover, too. Um, uh, but if anything, I'm also uh, impressed by the work that uh, particularly, like, particularly young Americans have done to open the door to artists, not just in America, but all over the world, to make their, work fun, uh, make their work fundable, like Kickstarter. And when Kickstarter emerged, I contacted the two guys who were doing it and brought them to RISD. And uh, they set up very quickly with our group uh, because the idea that artists didn't have to, quote unquote, beg to make their thing get made, could instead make the case for why they want to get it made and look for scale opportunities around it. Kickstarter has emerged. Places like Upstart is another example of an organization designed to enable people who are creative to be able to commercialize what they're doing. Again, it, commercialize means so many things. It doesn't have to mean being a Zuckerberg. It could be a cottage industry person who wants to just make five things a year. Um, uh, Arco de Boleno, uh, an adventure by Ambra Mehta, formerly of Design Miami. She has an entire organization built around supporting people who want to make one-off objects, designed objects. And so what I'm excited about is that there are many institutions out there that are now bringing the market to artists and designers like no other. And lastly, I am such a fan of the square. And the square will go away because the paradigm keeps shifting. But I love the idea that I can be an artist who could never get a piece to be sold in the Gagosian Gallery Network, but I could stand right outside on the sidewalk, outside Gagosian, and I could, take a credit, I could take a credit card swipe for a painting. I love that. Look what Banksy is doing. He's messing everybody up right now. <laughs> so I'm optimistic that models are being built. I am pessimistic about a lot of movement afoot to pull the arts backwards. Um, into a state of, we need help, we need help. Last story. Um, I, um, uh, I was, uh, my, my, my kids' elementary school one year, uh, I was noticing they had this thing called the, the Walk for the Arts. The Walk for the Arts is you walk around the elementary school multiple times, you pledge, and you raise money for art supplies. And this concept always, I'm, I love the arts, I'm President RISD, but this concept always bothered me, and I didn't know why. And I asked my good friend, Jesse Sheffern, who's a great artist, I said, why does this bother me? And she said, John, it's because, the jo because it, it makes the arts feel like some disease we have to eradicate. <laughs> no joke, but it's like, it made me think. And so a lot of what I believe the arts role is the arts role is an empowerment. It's a message at the, at the World Economic Forum 
in different places. I'd like to see that message shift, um, and it's happening in uh, little bits and pieces. Um, it's, a, it's a tremendous asset to our country, and I hope I gave you that impression that you'd want to bring the arts into your world in any way possible, because uh, 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 the arts wish to serve America in this way. Thank you, guys. Thank you.